everyone. Good afternoon. Happy New Year and welcome to the White House Dialogue on Men's Health. I'd like to introduce Broderick Johnson, White House Cabinet Secretary and Chair of the My Brother's Keeper Task Force. Good afternoon. Welcome to the White House. It's a Friday afternoon. It's great to see so many people here. And uh, it's great to have all of you here to talk about these very, very important issues that really men, right, uh, we can all admit don't talk about enough, don't talk about in large and small groups enough. So welcome to the White House and thank you for uh, being here and for lending your distinguished uh, voices and the important work that you do to this dialogue that we're having here today. Uh, our purpose here is, is rather simple, but so important. We need to elevate the conversation about men's health in this country, right? Just quite simply, we really need to. We need to cultivate a dialogue about health that resonates, but that is also sustainable and accessible. And believe me, from here at the White House, we need the help of all of you who are in this room. This isn't a discussion that we can begin and end at the White House, of course, or in government agencies, or even just in hospitals and doctor's offices. Instead, these are challenges that we need to tackle within our communities and among our families and in our everyday lives. We need to have these discussions also in our living rooms, in our kitchens, in our barber shops, and as we watch the NFL playoffs and uh, college hoops over the coming days and weeks, yes? We should interrupt our friends as we're watching these sporting events, depending on the score, depending on who you're for, to say, hey, let's talk about men's health. I'm a big believer in community-based solutions, just like my boss, the President of the United States. In addition to serving as the White House Cabinet Secretary, it is also my privilege to serve as the Chairman of the President's My Brother's Keeper Task Force, which aims to address persistent opportunity gaps faced by boys and young men of color, and really to ensure that all of our young people can reach their full potential through community-based solutions. I'm really proud of the MBK work, and in particular, there are a couple lessons we've already learned during the MBK work that are especially instructive for purposes of our conversations here today. First, I've learned we can't just talk about opportunity gaps without talking also about the health and well-being of our most vulnerable youth their parents, their moms, their dads, and folks throughout their communities. Health truly impacts such a broad cross-section of every person's life. And in this way, our charge today isn't simply to promote men's health, but it's to strengthen communities and families, it's to improve our economy and promote stability in our workforce, and really to do whatever we can to ensure that men are thoughtful and informed about our health choices and the impact that these decisions have on people who love and depend on us and who we love and who we depend on. The second lesson that I think we can apply from MBK thus far is that good policies are only part of the solution. Policy has its purpose. And we'll hear a lot today about the profound ways that, for example, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, or as we all very affectionately now refer to it as Obamacare, is improving the lives of folks throughout communities across the country. And indeed, more good policies, though, have to, be, uh, have to also be teamed with a multifaceted solution or set of solutions with stakeholders and leaders like all of you partnering with voices from the medical community, from philanthropy, from the business community, from employees, and from many, many others. So that's why I'm so glad that all of you have come here today, because today's dialogue could truly be the beginning of a collaboration that we indeed, indeed need to take to a higher level. Uh, we're just entering the final year of this administration. Um, the President often reminds us that we're in the second half of the fourth quarter. Uh, he loves sports analogies. A lot of good things happen in the fourth quarter, as the President said. A lot of good things are happening in the second part of the fourth quarter already. I cannot overstate how deeply the President cares about these issues involving men's health and health in general. From day one, 
The President has led the fight to tirelessly expand access to coverage. And of course, we've made some hard-won hard progress. The uninsured rate today is, in fact, lower than it has ever been in this nation's history. But we've still got a lot of work to do. And as we head into this year's open enrollment period, we have to keep in mind that men comprise 57 percent of the eligible uninsured population. So the importance of health insurance certainly remained a key part of our playbook here in the fourth quarter. Our dialogue was to also extend to mental health issues. Earlier this week, the President announced significant new resources to increase access to mental health care by proposing a new $500 million investment to protect the health of children and communities, to prevent suicide, and to promote mental health as a top health priority. This, of course, was all part of the announcement the President made just the other day about gun safety executive actions. And finally, our approach must confront the toll that addiction has taken on too many Americans and their families, with particular attention to the rise in prescription drug abuse and heroin use. This scourge is painfully affecting so many of our communities, while also straining law enforcement and treatment programs. And that is why the President recently announced important steps to expand prescriber training and access to treatment for addiction issues. These are big challenges. And I'm sure to many of you, as it is to me, these are very personal challenges. I've reached a point in my own life where I know better than to take my health for granted, despite how hard we work here at the White House. The President is also often reminding us that we have to take care of ourselves. I've reached a point where I have many friends and loved ones for whom preventative care and prevention have made a profound difference, literally, in whether they live or they die. In recent months, I've had friends confide in me that they've been diagnosed with prostate and lung cancers, but early diagnosis and treatment are saving their lives. And as an African-American man, I can be especially cognizant of the unique challenges that are facing lower income and disrupted health service communities. Poor behavioral health outcomes are indeed a real, real challenge to the African-American community. So I'm personally committed to do whatever I can to foster a culture in which men are encouraged to be proactive about our health without concern to stigma or stereotypes, egos, or other barriers. So let's make today's dialogue the start of a new phase in our collaboration. I want to thank all of you again for being part of this. I look forward to your partnership in the year ahead. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce a distinguished leader on these matters and a steadfast advocate for improving our nation's health, the Surgeon General of the United States, Vivek Murthy. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much for, for that kind introduction and good afternoon to all of you. It is so good to be here. How's everyone doing today? Great. great. Doesn't sound so great. How's everyone doing today? Great. Yeah, that sounds better. That sounds better. Well, I got to say, this is a very unusual experience for me, being in a room with almost all guys. Because I, I work at the Department of Health and Human Services, where we have the, the privilege of working with some incredible and extraordinary uh, women who lead our department. <clears throat> But there aren't that many guys there. And in fact, when my staff came to me and approached me about speaking at this event, I was thrilled to do so. But they looked relieved. They said, well, you know, there are not that many guys that we can ask. So <laughs> here, here we are. And it's not that often I told them that being a guy is a, is a qualification for doing stuff. But uh, this is an unusual situation. But I'm, I'm thrilled to be here because this issue is so important to me, to you, to all of us, the issue of making sure that men all across America are healthy, and strong. And when I was coming over here, I was reminded uh, of a man that I met uh, many months ago when I first began my tenure as Surgeon General in Salt Lake City. And his name is James. And at the beginning of my tenure, I, I started by doing these listening sessions where I would travel to small towns and big cities all across the country because I wanted to understand firsthand what people were experiencing, uh, what they were dealing with, but also what ideas they had for how we could solve some of our most vexing challenges. And there in Salt Lake City, as I was just getting started, uh, a man wheeled himself uh, into the room. And his name is James. And James listened uh, to people talking for a while. And then at some point, he raised his hand. 
and he told us his story. And James was in a wheelchair when I met him, but he wasn't always in a wheelchair. Like many men, uh, he grew up uh, fairly healthy early in life and thought that he was going to remain healthy his entire life. He didn't think that sickness would touch him. But at some point, he developed diabetes. And initially, it wasn't that big of a deal. He didn't really feel much different. But then later, he started getting these infections in his legs. And as many of you know, people with diabetes are unfortunately more prone to develop infections. The infections were mild in the beginning, then they got more severe. And they got so bad at one point that James' doctors told him that he needed to have major surgery, an amputation, in fact, of part of his leg. Now, this was scary to James, not just because he was in danger of losing a part of his leg, but also because he didn't, he didn't have insurance coverage and he didn't have the money to pay for a surgery which was definitely going to be expensive. So he didn't know what to do. On the one hand, he was looking at bankrupting himself. On the other hand, he was worried about a life-threatening infection coming back. But then the Affordable Care Act happened and James was able to get uh, insurance coverage through the exchanges. And he, through that insurance coverage, he was then able to get the surgery that he needed. And that day that I saw James was just a few weeks or so after he had had the surgery. And while he was recovering and still had a long way to go, he felt such a sense of relief knowing uh, that he didn't have to deal with those infections, uh, knowing that if he had other health problems in the future, that he would have insurance coverage and could get the care that he needed. So that story stuck with me. And all of us are here today because we recognize that it is so important for men in our country to do more to take care of their health. And this is true whether you're a man living with a chronic medical condition or whether you're healthy but hoping to prevent illness in the future or be able to deal with illness should it arise. We're also here because we know that this is an urgent situation. We know that the when we look at the folks who are uninsured in our country, that nearly 6 out of 10 of them are men. We know that many of the uninsured who are eligible uh, for coverage are healthy, but they need coverage to help protect them uh, in case they get sick. And this is especially important because we also know that nearly 80% of folks who are uninsured have less than $1,000 in the bank. Do you think about that? That could easily, the cost of a hospitalization could easily exceed that. So many folks who are out there uninsured don't have much of a safety net at all in their bank accounts. I want to recognize, though, that many of the people in this room and many folks who are watching uh, you know, through the, li the live cast, I know that many of you have been working on these problems for a long time. I know that you've been doing incredible things in your communities to advance the health of men. And I'm not just saying that because it's a nice thing to say. I'm saying that because last night I stayed up and read many of your bios. And, and it was an incredible thing. And it was actually late at night. It was 1 AM. And my wife and I have made this like, decision that we're going to try to get more sleep because it's better for your health. I was like, I started reading uh, the bios, and I, I was like, I was so, I just had to keep going because the work that you have done is so impressive. I know that some of you are working with fathers to help them be better fathers uh, and to be more responsible fathers. I know that many of you are working with men on preventive health in your communities. I know that many of you are working to get men uh, access to coverage. Uh, in your own ways, each of you are helping to get men healthier, to create a stronger, more vibrant community, a stronger country. And I just want to applaud you for that, because one of the most inspiring parts of this job is not necessarily sharing information with people, but for me, it's learning about the ingenuity, the creativity, the commitment and passion that people like you have on the ground. And it's that commitment that is ultimately going to make us uh, a stronger country. Now, everyone in this room, uh, I know you've done a lot, but we, we've got a lot to do. And we have a lot more to do if we want all men in this country, men who I think of really as our brothers, to be able to live a healthy and prosperous life. And what we need to do is we need to go back home, and we need to talk to young men in particular, and convince them that they're not invincible, that none of us are, and that they need coverage too. We need to be able to tell people that there is financial assistance available because so many people still don't know. They still don't know that many people are getting health insurance through the exchanges for just $75 a month. Many folks out there, out there also don't know that they can get help, that they're not alone, that they can get free help, in fact, on the phone or in person so that they can find out what the right insurance coverage is for them. 
And most importantly, we have to have these conversations everywhere we go, whether it's in church or temples or mosques, whether it's in barber shops or corner stores, at football games or at community events. We have to talk to people where they are and make sure that they have this kind of information. You know, I, I want to just end on a personal note. I, I mentioned my, my wife, Alice, earlier, and she and I just got married uh, in August uh, of this past year. And, uh, and it's a wonderful experience to be, to be married, I think. I've heard many people before they were married told me that it's going to feel different, even if you've been with your partner for a long, long time. And they were right. It does feel different. It feels, it feels wonderful. But since getting married, I've been doing a lot of thinking. I've been thinking about what kind of husband I want to be. And if I'm so blessed to have the opportunity to have children, I've been thinking about what kind of father I would want to be as well. And I've been thinking that I want to be the kind of father who sets a good example for his children. I want to be the kind of husband and father uh, who's able to be there for as long as possible uh, for his family because he's made the investment in staying healthy uh, and in being strong. And I want to be the kind of husband and father who can do even more for my family because I have the stamina, the endurance, and the health to be there for them, to play ball with my kids, to take walks with my wife, to take my family on trips. This is the kind of father and husband that I want to be. And when I think about the people that I have met in this year alone, uh, my first year of being Surgeon General, the young men in particular, who I've met from different neighborhoods, from different races and ethnicities, from different socioeconomic backgrounds. They have a lot of things that are different about them, but they share certain common hopes. The hope of being able to live a full life, the hope of being able to raise a family, the hope of being able uh, to pursue their dreams at home as well as at work. And what strikes me when I meet these young men is that health is the key to their hopes. And when I think of us, what we can do together, you and I, by helping more men get covered, we can help put these hopes within the reach of men all across America. That's fundamentally what coverage is about. It's not just about signing a paper. It's about getting access to your hopes and your dreams that you achieve through better health. So I want to thank all of you so much for your commitment to this issue. I want to thank you for helping get men covered all across America. And most importantly, I want to thank you for the commitment that so many of you display in your work each and every day to help our country get healthier and stronger. Thank you so much. And with this, it's my, my great pleasure to introduce another extraordinary leader uh, who we are uh, blessed to have in this administration and in this White House. That's our director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, uh, a man who uh, does incredible work every day, but who also has an incredible story that has brought him to this work uh, and, and informs his commitment. And that's Director Michael Botticelli. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here with Broderick and the Surgeon General. Uh, to join you and all these distinguished speakers who will talk about next steps in improving men's health. Um, my work and my role as Director of National Drug Control Policy has been profoundly shaped by my own experience, both as a person in long-term recovery and as a gay man. For me and for many other LGBT folk, these are intertwined issues. We all know that illness and health happen not just at the individual level, but are directly connected to community. And we are more clearly coming to understand and address these social determinants of health. We know that men share an unfortunate disproportionate impact as it relates to substance use issues. Men are more likely to be heavy drinkers or current or former smokers, to use drugs, or to have a substance use disorder. In 2014 alone, the vast majority of drug-induced deaths and alcohol-induced deaths were suffered by men. In total, close to 53,000 men died of these causes each year. A recent article by no Nobel-winning ec economist documented the rising mortality rate of 45 to 50-year-old white non-Hispanic men from 1999 to 2013, largely attributed to alcohol use, drug overdoses, and suicide. These facts speak to some of the challenges we are facing to improve men's health. The Affordable Care Act helps immensely. 
It builds on the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, extending substance use disorder benefits and mental health coverage to over 60 million Americans by requiring their coverage as essential health benefits. It finally recognizes that mental health and substance use are part of one's overall health. We know, however, that having access to high quality, affordable care improves health, but we know that coverage alone does not always mean that people will access it. As a man and as a member of both the addiction recovery and LGBT communities, I have experienced with these types of barriers to health and community health service utilization often faced by men who belong to these communities. For a while, I knew I needed help, but I was too ashamed and embarrassed to ask for it. Afraid people would think that I was stupid or weak-willed. Wondered how I could live my life as a gay man and not drink. I didn't enter treatment 27 years ago because I wanted to or because I thought I needed help. I went into the treatment system, unfortunately, because of my involvement with the criminal justice system. And my experience was by no means unique. Many people do not he seek help for substance use disorder until it becomes severe and chronic, sometimes because they don't know they have a problem, but most often because of the shame and stigma that still surrounds substance use and addiction. We also know that marginalized groups and historically discriminated people, such as the LBGT community, have higher rates of substance use disorders. Accessible, culturally appropriate services must be available in all of our communities. For me, finding a primary care physician who understands the circumstances of my life is equally, if not more important, than having health insurance. As I said, stigma is often another key factor uh, uh, affecting our response to substance use and substance use disorders. It certainly affected my ability to recognize and seek help when I knew that I needed it. The language that we use in reference to substance use and substance use disorders, alcoholic, junkie, addict, continue to perpetuate shame and stigma that many people with drug problems feel and keep people from seeking help. Time and time again, stigma has shown to delay or inhibit care-seeking behavior. We long ago stopped tolerating this kind of language in relation to people with other chronic conditions or disabilities, and it's time to reject the language that stigmatizes those with substance use problems. Asked re recently whether it was harder for me to come out as a gay man or to go public as a person in long-term recovery, I had to acknowledge that it was harder to admit that I was in recovery from addiction. We still have much work ahead. We know that we can't separate health issues from larger social justice issues. This administration understands and recognizes the fact and continues to work to not only expand access to care, but to address the social justice issues that impact the health of our communities. I look forward to the work ahead, and I look forward to being a partner in the work that we're doing together. Thank you very much. I'd like for the first panel to please join me. Thank you. And now we'll have a little history. <laughs> and we have several gentlemen who will share with us why their health matters. Oh. And if I could, I'd like to start with Kenneth Braswell. Good afternoon. Come on, we already, didn't we go through this one time already? <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And so my name is Kenneth Braswell. I was trying to put my stopwatch on so I can be obedient with respect to three minutes. And so I am the executive director of Fathers Incorporated. And in addition to that, I also oversee the President's National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And our partners over there, um, Lisa Washington Thomas and Robin McDonald um, have been a shepherd of our work for the last four to five years. 
Um, and we've done some incredible stuff around the country with respect to responsible fatherhood. In addition to that, um, Fathers Incorporated also has a campaign called Code Blue. Um, we just finished a paper, um, myself and Dr. Sidney Hankerson, could you raise your hand, Dr. Hankerson, um, from Columbia University, where we are beginning to look at specifically mental health um, of black men in black churches, um, something that we have not had a chance to really look at to engage faith-based institutions with respect to both being an advocate of mental health, or well, not an advocate of mental health, but an advocate of preventing mental health issues for our black men um, and other issues as well. We also have a campaign called The Honorable Man. Those of you who walked in saw this blue bow tie sitting on the table. Um, it is our campaign to begin to encourage this whole notion of honorable men. And one of the first principles of the honorable men is self-care. That in order to be honorable for your family and honorable to yourself, that you first have to care about yourself. Um, the last thing I will tell you about is a relationship that we have with Omega Sci Fi, and many, many of them are in the room. Uh, we have an organization and an MOU together where we have decided to also do work in this area of health and other men and fatherhood issues. But that's not what they asked me to come up here and talk to you about today. And so, but I had to get that in um, because it was just necessary for me to do that. And we're going to roll real fast. And they wanted me to tell you about me. And so I'm a product of a single mother household. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York in the 60s and 70s, right? And so as a young man growing up in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, in our apartments, um, health was our issue. Um, my, both my brother, my sister, and I were frequent, uh, were frequent visitors to the emergency room for our asthma. Um, those of you who grew up in Brooklyn or inner city communities around the country knew that the things that we played with always weren't the safest things to play with. Before we knew what asbestos was, we were in the basement breaking asbestos off of the pipes and drawing hopscotch and skelly courts on the street, baseball lines and those kinds of things. We also laid in the bed and peeled off lead-based chips off of the wall, not knowing what it was and oftentimes eating and consuming lead-based chips. So that is some of my background with respect to me growing up. But I also wasn't asked to come up here and talk to you about that but I needed you to know that. <laughs> what I want to do is I was asked to motivate you, inspire you, and lighten you up a little bit because you're going to hear a lot of things today. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about is what happens when I begin to think about health. Next slide. One of the things that happens in my life that I've begun to think about health is when I found out I needed more than one pair of glasses. Y'all real quiet. <laughs> And y'all know some of y'all got a piece of paper in front of you and you're doing like this when somebody hands you a piece of paper. But as men, oftentimes we don't begin to start thinking about our health until something begins to happen to us. One of the other things that happened where I began to start thinking about my health is when I have to tell my son that I have to do something when I know I'm just too tired to go on. Silence. Like none of you have no young seven-year-old sons in your house. But oftentimes, you know, we make an excuse. Men make excuses about our health, and oftentimes it is with our children. Another time that I began to think about my health is when I realized I was paying a membership for a Gold's Gym, and I had moved out the city and didn't even remember where that I, when I had applied for the Joe's Gym membership. And my wife had to bring it to my attention. What is this? What is this Gold? And I didn't even know what it was about. And this is the last thing that makes me think about my health. And this is as I now turn 54 years old. That every time I get out of the car, stand up in a chair, get out of the bed, or, or kneel down, I realize that I can't do that without making a noise. <laughs> And so those are some of the things that make me think, and I hope, hopefully they'll make you laugh about this issue of health, because you're going to hear a lot of very touching stories today. And I really wanted to come up and lighten that up. And I also wanted to share a couple of things in, in, in the way that I think about health sometimes that I don't want to think about health. Sometimes, as men, we don't want to think about health when we're sitting in the emergency room with a sports injury that we know we're too old to have. Those of you who still think you can dunk, those of you who still think you can hit a home run, and you're sitting in a hospital room, and your wife is saying, I don't understand why you're out there with those young kids, that's something that makes us not want to think about our health. 
The other time that I don't want to think about my health is when I realize that everybody else is waiting for me to catch up. Okay, that didn't go over too well, but this is one. And this is a touching one because this is a friend of mine just dealt with this. And this is when your family has to borrow money to bury you because you believe that you would live forever. And as leaders, we have to understand at the first instance that if we ever expect to talk to another man or woman or child about the importance of health, if we're not taking care of ourselves, what are we talking about? Why are we talking about this? Is that if as leaders, we're not concerned about our own health. So I challenge you as someone who struggles we're paying attention to my own health, to pay attention to your health. Because people depend on you, people need you, and people want you around. But let me share with you just one instance of someone who I really, really love, right? Said something to me that made me think. Then go to that next slide. And so we know that love attacks the soul. And so typically when you are uh, dealing with issues that typically it is the person who loves you the most that can hit you the hardest, that can really hit you where you live. This little young man here is my seven-year-old son. And on New Year's, I mean Christmas Eve, think about this as a little boy, on Christmas Eve he walks into my office in the house and he says, Daddy, this is you. Look at this picture. <laughs> Y'all didn't catch that, right? He says, Daddy, this is you. He still got his toys on Christmas, although there was a heated debate <laughs> about that. But he got his toys on Christmas. But it made me to think that, um, like the other slides you saw, that our children and our family as men are always watching us. And when we care about our health, we change the whole paradigm about the people around us and how they look at health. And I want to encourage you today, particularly men in the, off, in the audience, and as women who have men at home that you care about, to show them that you care about their health, to talk to them about their health, to encourage them about their health. Because as men, one day you're going to get up, and you're going to be on your way to a family reunion, and you're going to grab your baseball hat, and you're going to grab your white sneakers and your black socks, and you're going to put on your gray sweatpants with your members only jacket, and nobody is going to laugh. And you're going to think that you look like the best in the entire room, and no one is going to laugh. And you know why? Because what you're wearing doesn't matter. It only matters that you're in the room. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. My name is Stephen Avila, and it is a true privilege to be up here today to participate in this forum on men's health here at the White House. I'm currently an advisor at the Department of Interior, but before I started working there, I worked right here at the White House in the Office of Presidential Correspondence. One of the best parts of my job was reading letters and stories written by the American people to President Obama. As you can imagine, people write the President on a variety of issues. But there was one issue that always touched me the most. It was on health care and the impact the Affordable Care Act had on people all across this country. We shared many of those stories with the President, but little did I know that I would have one myself. In March of last year, I began to experience pain in my lower back. I had originally shrugged it off, thinking I had hurt myself in the gym playing soccer. After a few weeks of persistent pain, I finally walked into my local urgent care. After referring me to a specialist to get an ultrasound done, and then an MRI, a CAT scan, a urologist, tons of blood work, and finally an oncologist, I was diagnosed with stage three testicular cancer with a seven and a half centimeter tumor growing in my abdomen. I remember being shocked and scared when I heard the C word, as anyone would. Talk about a quick escalation. How could this have happened? I'm an active, healthy 25 year old guy. Turns out it's just bad luck, mutation in my DNA, but let me tell you that doesn't make the diagnosis any be easier to bear. Fortunately for me, even at stage three, testicular cancer is curable, but not without a fight. 
After two major operations, three months of chemotherapy, and more doctor visits than I can count, I was given the news I was always hoping for but never promised. I was declared cancer-free in October, and this horrible burden was finally lifted from my shoulders. Thank you. The holiday season just came and went, and I have a lot to be grateful for. Most importantly, my health. But I have a lot to be thankful for in terms of what went right. I'm thankful that I never hesitated to go to the doctor when I first suspected something was wrong. Do you know why? Because I had health insurance. In fact, I was still on my parents' plan. I'm grateful that as I turned 26, halfway through chemotherapy, mind you, and that was a fun birthday, one that I hope I never have to repeat, I was able to enroll in a plan of my own, no questions asked. I'm even more grateful that I don't have to worry about having a pre-existing condition follow me around the rest of my life, because although I was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 25, I still intend on living a whole lot more. And so I want to thank everyone in this room, and for those who fight to expand access, raise awareness of diseases that affect us all, and for those that have been there for people in times of need. I want to leave you with the thought that one of my doctors had given me when I was first diagnosed. And he said, you know, Stephen, men pre usually have a pretty good idea when something's wrong with them, particularly their sexual health. It's a whole other issue of getting them to go see the doctor. If more young men came in to see the doc, we could prevent a lot of tragedies. And you know what? I couldn't agree more. So again, I want to thank you for all that you do and for being here today. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Raman Bastani, and a, uh, a number of years ago, a few friends of mine and I went out. Uh, I just got out of a long relationship, and we went out to some bar and met some people, and I met this girl who I thought was cute. We got along well, um, and by the end of the night, we ended up going back to my apartment. And we were in the living room, and things continued to kind of go well, <laughs> so we started to make our way towards the bedroom. As we did, she noticed the hesitation in me, and she's like, hey, what's, what's your deal? And I said. Uh, nothing, I'm fine. She's like, no, something's wrong. Are, are you gay? And I said, no, I just brought you home with me. <laughs> and she, um, she said, well, then if something's wrong, I, wait, do you have HIV or an STD or something? I said, no, no. But in my mind, I started thinking, I don't know this girl, right? And before I could think of anything else, she stepped away and she said, oh my God, yes, you do. You have an STD. And I said, no, no, I'm just afraid you might. And she slapped me in the face, <laughs> walked right out the room. <laughs> and I sat there thinking, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> And our incredible team at Healthvana has uh, created one. We help large healthcare providers, um, for example, sexual health clinics, deliver test results to patients in real time in a way that's very easy for them to understand, in a way that tells them what to do next, and sends them timely reminders, all at their fingertips. Now, that certainly could have been helpful that night for me, right, if I could have just shown my test results, if I had them with me. And it can also... <laughs> And it can also make a big difference for the 20 million people that get HIV or an STD every single year in the U.S. that's costing our healthcare system about $30 billion annually. Um, we, I am certain we can create a paradigm shift in healthcare by empowering patients, by engaging patients, by showing them good, de good design, uh, smart technology. It's possible. We're seeing it. With our company, we've delivered maybe 200,000 test results in the last year to patients. 80% of those patients check their test results within one day. 80% checking in their health in one day. So that's what healthcare looks like in the 21st century in 2016. It doesn't look like the antiquated ways of, let's say, Windows 95 looking systems, right? Think more about what health would look like if it looked like Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, things we're used to using on a daily basis. I promise you if we apply those kinds of principles and meet people where they're at, it'll make a gigantic difference in people's health. And, and this is a personal story for me, not just the one I shared earlier, um, but I've, uh, I've been a caregiver to, uh, to, two parent, uh, to two family members end up passing away. And I've, uh, 
I've dedicated myself to making a meaningful impact in people's health because I know there is a better way. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Bellet, and I'm co-founder of Echo Devices. At Echo, we've developed an FDA-cleared and smartphone-connected digital stethoscope that wirelessly transfers patient heart and lung sounds from the clinician's stethoscope to the patient's electronic health record. Using Echo, a nurse practitioner conducting a sports physical here in the US can send a heart sound to a cardiologist at their local hospital. An at-home nurse can send the heart and lung sounds of a COPD or CHF patient to their primary care doctor with the push of a button. And a healthcare worker in Haiti, the most impoverished country in the Western Hemisphere, can share a concerning sound with a cardiologist at Johns Hopkins or Stanford for a potentially life-saving second opinion. For the first time in history, patients' hearts and lung sounds are now part of their electronic health record able to be analyzed, shared, and monitored by their entire care team. Today I want to share a story. It's a tough story, but a story that has inspired our team, the ECHO team, over the last two years as we've brought this product to market. On February 7th, 2014, while my co-founders and I were still in our senior year at UC Berkeley, our football team's defensive lineman, Ted Agu, died suddenly during an early morning training run. Ted was known at Cal for his gregarious personality and contagious smile. After graduation, he actually wanted to be a doctor. So soon after Ted passed away, it was discovered that he was the victim of what many call the athlete's silent killer, sudden cardiac death caused by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is the same all too familiar silent killer that steals the life of a young athlete in the US every three days and stole the life of famous basketball players Reggie Lewis and Hank Gathers. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy attacks athletes and non-athletes alike and is just one of the many manifestations of heart disease that impacts young men and women in the United States. A recent CDC report places heart disease as the fifth leading cause of death for young Americans and the leading cause of death for adult men. Our goal as a digital health startup is to do our part in outing the silent killer. We've partnered with clinicians at UCSF, Stanford, and the Mayo Clinic to modernize the stethoscope, a, a device that 30 million clinicians use around the world as the first line of defense in detecting heart and lung abnormalities. We figure, why not start with the tool that every clinician already has around their neck? February 1st is the start of American Heart Month a month where we honor the memories of Ted Agu and the hundreds of thousands of Americans that pass away each year due to heart disease. But may it also be a month where everyone in this room, amazing community organizers and government officials, entrepreneurs, come together and reaffirm our investment in technologies and programs that make health screenings more accessible to men, women, and children, especially in underserved communities. On, in, on February 1st, ECHO is partnering up with IBM to launch a cardiac telemedicine initiative in Haiti to make this technology accessible to millions of Haitians in underserved communities with little access to cardiac specialists and cardiologists. It's going to be an exciting year, and if there's any way that we can support the work that you are doing, or vice versa, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. So if you're uh, watching your watches or your phones, and I certainly am, you will notice that it is 3 o'clock and we are not at our breakout sessions. So I want to stop the program for just a second to introduce Robin in the corner. And she has two signs in her hand I want her to show to the speakers. One says you have one minute. Let's show the other one. That one says you have to stop talking. And now I'd like to bring up the next panel, please. <laughs> Dr. Bonham, Dr. Longjohn, and Mr. Block. No. Thank you. 
Okay, good. Good afternoon and thank everyone for your interest in men's health. I'd like to open with a person to sharing a personal story. I was talking to some women at Morehouse School of Medicine, female professors, about men not seeing the doctor, and they shared with me that as girls they were seen by the pediatrician, but as soon as they became old enough to be considered women, they were referred to the gynecologist, creating a continuity of care beyond childhood. For boys, do we have that same type of situation? The study show, David Salmon's study, for instance, shows that uh, the 18 to 29 year age group has the greatest disconnect between males and, and the health care system that gradually decreases with age, but not having this group under the, under the surveillance of the health care system is a big mistake because even if among these young men, there's a lot of pre-diabetes, pre-hypertension, overweight, obesity, high cholesterol is going to cause much more serious disease in the years to come. Uh, there are other reasons in the health care system why uh, men are disconnected. For instance, work uh, hours often, often conflict with health care uh, service hours. Uh, a lot of men cannot take off time from work. Uh, they can't afford um, the loss in salary and, and the like, and some will lose their jobs. Uh, men as a gender are less likely to carry health insurance. Uh, the public does not know enough about men's health. So we have actually been threatened with being sued by women when we were doing prostate exams on the men because they wanted to know why we were doing it only on the men. How can we, how can we, ask, <laughs> how can we ask the public and men to take care of their health when they don't know what the issues are? Uh, there are also cultural barriers related to male socialization. For instance, uh, men are taught to be stoic. When a boy is eight years old and he skins his knee, they tell him brave boys don't cry. When he's 50 having chest pain, he says, oh, that's just indigestion because he's been taught to ignore pain. Uh, distrust of the health care system. Among the African Americans here, how many of you have heard uh, when, men, when, when, when black people go to that hospital, they don't come out again? Anybody heard that? Yeah, I heard a veteran this morning say he doesn't want anything to do with the VA system. Uh, Latinos uh, may fear immigration consequences and the like. Then there's also fatalism. Some people just think it's your time to go, it's your time to go, especially poor people that have had little control over their destiny. And there's also maladaptive self-reliance. A lot of men uh, may recognize a problem, but they'll try to solve it themselves because they think that that's their duty as a man. Uh, next slide, please. Now, some of the lessons that we learned in helping men to do better, bringing health screenings to the workplace. The Men's Health Network has brought health screenings to Capitol Hill and to workplaces, holding uh, health events on times that don't conflict with men's work hours, engaging entire families to bring men in in the first place and to promote compliance. The peer-to-peer -peer approach. James Brown was a prostate cancer patient, and he used to do PSAs for us. He'd say, he'd say I feel good, and I want you to feel good, too, so get checked out. Um, <laughs> taking time to, prom to explain to the man what's going on. Men are more compliant when they understand why you're asking them to take medication and what it can do for them. Uh, men are performance oriented. We're taught to achieve, compete, produce, and uh, selling good health to men as a way of being able to achieve these goals is sometimes more effective than trying to use fear. We have to be very careful to be culturally sensitive and linguistically appropriate. I hear people talking to, to lay people about myocardium and perfusion, and I say, wait a minute, they don't understand that. We need to talk people's language. Asian and Pacific Islanders have about 120 different languages. We need to understand how to speak to people in ways they can understand. Men may be more receptive to health care in the form of a group event, just like going to a ball game with other men, and also advertising through multiple media venues, especially social media these days, can be especially effective. And some people have suggested sports medicine as a way to retain young males in, in contact with the health care system. Uh, next slide. I think the most important barrier is indifference and sometimes misguided political opposition to men's health, but I think that what we fail to realize is the effect that men's health has a, on the whole of society. Uh, with death or disability of a husband, a woman can, be, can suffer bereavement, she can suffer uh, loss of a long-term companion and disability, the burden of care may fall to her, widows themselves are at increased risk of dying, health care expenses may be increased in the face of reduced earnings and disability. There's economic effects on the whole of society, absenteeism, uh, employers having to uh, replace workers, former providers becoming dependents, diminish work productivity. We have maternal and child, uh, maternal and child health, but it's now known that fathers 
can, uh, can the health of fathers can affect their children. A man exposed to a chemical that shuts down a tumor suppressor gene, his grandchildren may get cancer. So I'll close by saying men and women's health are not like opposite ends of a seesaw. If one goes up, the other doesn't have to go down. It's more like a rising tide lifts all boats. For men and women's health, it's not either or, or it's both or neither. If we don't optimize men's health, we won't optimize women's health either. We need to take a four-pronged approach, women's health, men's health, children's health, and, uh, and uh, minority health as co-equal partners if we hope to build a complete and inclusive health care system. So men's health currently receives the least attention of any of these, and that's what we're here today to change. Thank you very much, and thanks for your time. Good afternoon. People are getting that now. Um, I, I'm Dr. Matt Longshot. I'm the National Health Officer for the YMCA of the USA. It's a great pleasure to be here talking about such an important topic. Um, you know, everybody does that YMCA dance, but I don't know if you all know what those YMCA letters stand for. It's the Young Men's Christian Association. Um, young and men and, you know, Christian Association has changed over time to be more inclusive and uh, changed a great deal. Our statistics are no longer what you might su suspect from that name. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, more than a majority of our um, members, 22 million across the country, that participate in Y centers all over the country, Y facilities all over the country, uh, are women. And um, we host uh, with great joy people with um, uh, coming from many cultural and, and interfaith backgrounds. Um, uh, I have the pleasure of being the first physician executive at YMCA of the USA, our national uh, resource center for all Ys. Uh, reflecting our commitment in this new era of uh, employing different strategies uh, to promote prevention and preventive services and uh, serve the communities that we are operating in. Uh, this map here shows uh, the physical addresses of about 900 um, 501c3s that are part of our network. We have over 27, uh, just about 2,700 facilities uh, which are within five miles of about 80 percent of U.S. households. So when we think about our ability to be a partner in men's health, we're thinking about how to leverage this infrastructure. We have so many passionate and wonderful uh, staff operating in each of these facilities, uh, and they're uh, as committed to men's health as they've been since uh, the beginning of our 165-year history. Uh, in particular, I want to call attention to a topic that I know we're talking a lot about today, uh, access, improving access. Uh, and uh, WISE such as Detroit and um, the Central Florida YMCA in Orlando, uh, WISE in Texas all over the country have understood that uh, in partnership with the Office of, um, of uh, excuse me, Faith and Community Partnerships here at HHS, that we have a role to play in promoting enrollment and uh, helping people get access to insurance and care. And so I'm um, very proud of that partnership. Next slide, please. Our concept of healthy living at the Y is pretty complex and I don't know that you all can see this but it spans beyond what you might think of as traditional Y services where in the upper left of this framework we deliver programs to individuals and families. This is where you encounter the Y most often, dropping uh, boys off to swim at the pool or uh, young men going to work out at the fitness facilities, etc. That is probably 80% of what 80% of our Ys uh, are known for. Uh, but increasingly we are moving out to the right on this framework, getting involved not just in advocacy for issues like men's health, but also taking our programs, our skills, our wonderful staff out in the community. Uh, we've been the nation's uh, swim instructor for about 100 years, uh, but now we're focused on bringing what we know about promoting drowning prevention, important aspect of men's health uh, and health in the uh, uh, urban communities especially, um, taking what we know about sweet teaching swim lessons and bringing that to housing developments, for example. Um, in, uh, as you go down this framework, you get into issues around secondary and tertiary prevention. How do we help people, not just who are already healthy and fit coming to our facilities, but who have increased risk for diabetes, uh, for heart disease, et cetera, or who may already be living with an irreversible condition such as cancer um, and, or Parkinson's or dementia. Uh, we are reprogramming and redeveloping our portfolio of services to be able to meet the needs of of men up and down and right and left on this uh, spectrum. I'm going to just share with you a couple statistics here. We've, we've kind of built this whole system and we like to say if you build it they may come. Uh, you know we have to uh, do a lot of extra special work to make sure that 
our, uh, our men are receiving the services that we're trying to uh, push out there for prevention. Um, we have a blood pressure self-monitoring program that only has 34 percent of its participants being men. Uh, and that's actually the largest participating uh, percentage in our chronic disease prevention programs. For reasons that were mentioned, I think there's a, uh, a kind of uh, resistance, especially actually in groups where women are also part of the group uh, to share information about men's health and those services. So uh, WISE are doing a lot to um, create uh, men's specific outreach strategies, um, delivering programs on worksite uh, facilities uh, where um, men are more likely to um, maybe avoid the excuses that would get them to the why, let alone to the doctor. Um, we're making sure that as we deliver our physical activity services that we take into account that um, men have different backgrounds, different interests. Often we're delivering uh, these cardio workouts, et cetera, sometimes uh, in a way that feels familiar. Um, using uh, even like military uh, kind of drill sergeant methods to get um, veterans engaged in our programs. For uh, men sur survivors of cancer, we have different men support groups and, and things of the like. Um, I think I'd just close uh, by saying, because I know I'm out of time, um, that uh, one of the most interesting things, I know we've got a bunch of NFL folks here today, is our partnership with the NFL Players Association. Um, we have uh, been so pleased to be able to start working in over 105 cities with NFL players, and they're leaders in our community in uh, bringing people into the Y to help them understand our commitment to men's health. Um, also with the Wounded Warrior Project, things like that. So I'm uh, very committed to exploring any different avenue with y'all and um, finding a way to encourage men to take advantage of these preventive services. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Armin Brat. I guess you'll have to read the bio because I don't have time to uh, <laughs> actually tell you anything about me. Um, so. I used to do a lot of different kinds of media stuff. I started off writing books and have moved into a lot of different things. I've written a number of books, a series of books on fatherhood of my own, and also have been working with the Men's Health Network on a series of books, uh, starting off with one on, called The Blueprint for Men's Health, looks at overall health, and then Your Head, some of you may have seen uh, about mental health, and then lots of different other things. Uh, do radio shows, podcasts, co newspaper columns, a couple different ones. The, uh, the books have sold a few million copies. The, uh, radio show is in, on the American Forces Network, so it reaches a few million people. Um, articles in different places, newspaper columns, so I mean, just a, a lot of stuff, and all with the focus of getting information out there on parenting, getting information out there on fatherhood and on men's health, and uh, including social media and blogging, and I uh, manage, and some of you I actually talk to about this, I, I uh, kind of edit and manage the men's health network uh, blog called Talking About Men's Health, so we'd love to publish articles if you guys have any about, about that stuff. Um, next slide, please. So throughout all of this stuff, we found out that, that there is an approach that works, and Kenny Roswell talked about this kind of a, a little bit in passing, which is kind of appeal to the provider protector, really. It's basically saying, look, you play a unique role in your child's life. You play a unique role in your family's life. It's good for you. It's good for your kids. It's good for your wife. It's good for society as a whole for you to be there. You don't want to take care of yourself wonderful, be an idiot. However, your family needs you to be there. So take care of yourself for your family. That's kind of what it comes down to. Um, however, we're not getting enough people. So even with you know, a couple million books sold and I don't know how many tens of millions of people read columns, we're not getting everybody. And we need to come up with a different approach. And we cannot wait for men by themselves to get out there and take the initiative. We have to kind of get them, meet them where they are. Can you do the next slide, please, Ben? And so I want to tell you my, my philosophy on this whole, about how we're going to have to reach them. And we're, the way that we're going to have to reach them is kind of my flip way of saying we're going to have to get into their pants because that's where the information is happening. 90% of American adults have cell phones, 90%. And it's closer to 98% if you look at the demographic of, of uh, 18 to 45. That's a lot of people who've got cell phones. African Americans, this will seem somewhat counterintuitive, I think, but African Americans and Hispanics are more likely than whites to have cell phones. And if you look at, at smartphones, which is the, the <coughs> growing thing, you've got about two-thirds of Americans have smartphones overall. However, it's closer to 85% for the de that same demographic of 18 to 45. And again, African Americans and Hispanics <coughs> are much more likely to have smartphones than are whites, which I, I didn't quite understand that in the beginning, but when, what it came down, comes down to is this. That particular demographic is what's called uh, cell phone limited or cell phone dependent, which means it is their only 
access to the internet or their, or their main access to the internet. They have nothing else. There's an entire generation of people who went from nothing to a phone. And so if you want to reach people, that's the way you're going to have to do it. And you were talking, uh, I mean, about uh, social media, and I think that's a terrific thing. However, texting <coughs> is what I want to direct you to. I've been working with the Men's Health Network and uh, Deborah Frazier at the National Healthy Start Association uh, on a texting program we've been piloting. And uh, Men's Health Network has also done something with the Kappa's uh, Black Fraternity, looking at, at app ways of delivering messages, delivering things. And it, it is tremendously effective. You're talking about 80%, I think you said, of, of, uh, of people looked at, at the health results so with a text, any text, 90% <coughs> are open within three minutes. 90% open within three minutes. 99% are opened overall. That is compared to about 20% for an email. And I remember actually just a couple of years ago, was, uh, Ken Harris I was talking about some of this stuff and we're in there, it was in Florida, there was some sort of a flash flood warning. Every single person in the room got that little beep that there's a flash flood warning and every single person, I'm in the middle of talking about something, everybody reaches into their pocket and looks at the phone. That's how you got to get information to young men in particular about what's going on. Hey, here's something about, have you had a physical this week? Hey, have you taken your kids out for a walk? That kind of information. So I'm not giving up on, on traditional media. I'm not going to stop writing books. I'm not going to stop doing columns. I'm not going to stop doing radio shows and podcasts. But I am urging, I'm doing more of this texting and more social media myself, and I would urge you to do the same. And the deal is, if we want to reach these guys, particularly lower income men, that's how we're going to have to do it. And we'd be glad to work with you and encourage you to do it. If you need some help or, or encouragement, talk to me. Uh, Men's Health Network would be glad to, to work with the organization or you as individuals to help you get this stuff going. Because this is the, the big hitch is on outreach. We have all this great information. Everybody in here has got great information. How do you get it to the people who need it so that they can benefit from it and so you can uh, lengthen and improve the quality of lives? Thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists. And now I'd like to bring up our last panel before what will be a quick and modified break for us so that we can get back on track. And now we're going to talk about men and mental health. I'd like to start by first introducing Kevin Hines. It was foggy and overcast in San Francisco. I was pacing back and forth for 40 minutes, crying like a child. All I wanted was for one person to look at me and say the words, are you okay? Is something wrong? Or can I help you on this day that I was supposed to die? I found the spot atop the walkway of the Golden Gate Bridge. I paced once more. I stopped back at that spot and a woman approached me and I thought, she is going to save me. I don't have to take my life today. She's gonna ask me if I'm okay. And instead she looked right at me through her giant sunglasses that didn't fit her face. And she pulled out a camera, an old school digital camera as this was September 25th of the year 2000. She handed it to me and she said, will you take my picture? It was terrible timing, of course. <laughs> I took her camera. I clicked it five times. She posed different poses each time. I handed her the camera back. She said thank you in her foreign accent, and she walked away. When she walked away, I said, nobody cares. I walked back toward the traffic railing. I sprinted forward. And only using my two hands, I catapulted myself into free fall. The millisecond my hands left that rail it was an instant regret. The recognition that I had just made the single worst mistake of my life and that it was too late. 
I fell 225 feet, 25 stories, 75 miles per hour at a four second fall. I hit that water, I went down 70 to 80 feet, and then I opened my eyes. I thought you died on impact. I frantically moved in any direction I was going down. My eyes bulged, my ears began to ring. I shot for what I believed to be the surface. I found the surface, but not before nearly passing out and drowning. And I bobbed up and down in the water and I did what only I knew how to do my whole life. I prayed, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. Three things came into play to save my life that day. I call them my three miracles. The first was a woman driving by in a red car, saw me go over the rail at the point that I passed her, that she passed me, and she called her friend in the Coast Guard. The only reason they arrived to my position within less than the time I would set into hypothermia and drown or die was because of that woman. In the water as I flailed and floundered trying to stay afloat, not doing a very good job, swallowing salt water, spitting it out, and praying some more, something very alive <laughs> began to circle beneath me. Oh, this is great. I'm, I didn't die off of that silly bridge, and now a shark is going to devour me. <laughs> Wonderful. Except it didn't take a bite. It just circled beneath me, and no longer was I wading in the water. I was floating atop it on my back with this creature bumping me up. I was trying to punch it, trying to make it go away. I'm thinking, this is a very nice shark. <laughs> I found out sometime later while on the show Primetime Live with John Quinones, the guy that does that show, What Would You Do? As I said, I thought there was a shark beneath me. No, a man named Morgan wrote into the show. He said, Kevin, I'm so very glad you're alive. I was standing less than two feet away from you when you jumped. He said, it haunted me until this day because no one would tell me if you lived or died. By the way, there was no shark, Kevin. It was a sea lion. And the people above looking down believed it to be keeping you afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind you. That Coast Guard boat and those officers got me to safety physically to an ambulance. The ambulance took me to Marin General Hospital where a back surgeon who happened to be one of the foremost back surgeons on the face of this planet who wasn't supposed to be there that day, miracle number three, stayed for a separate reason. I came in and he opted to do my back surgery replacing my shattered vertebrae with metal saving me the ability to walk and run. I have found recovery. I stand in it every day. Every moment of every second of every day, I'm in recovery, and I'm fighting for my mental well-being, but it wasn't always like that. Seven psychiatric wards after that jump in less than 11 years for suicidal crisis and ideation and attempts. In that third psych ward stay, my uncle handed me a Time Magazine article about getting on a routine to battle mental illness. He said to me, Kevin, your family and your loved ones can, can help you until we're blue in the face, but until and when you take full responsibility for the fact that you have this illness and you have to fight it tooth and nail every day, he said, Kevin, ain't nothing gonna change. He left me with that article I brushed him off. I finally read it an hour later. I read it twice. It told me, and, how, and, and the next thing that occurred was I implemented a routine into my life of exercise, talk therapy, medication, meditation, sleep habits. I had to re restructure my circadian rhythm from the bottom down. I had to survive by all costs. And when I become suicidal today, which I do because I have chronic suicidal thoughts, I don't hold them in to myself anymore. I'm not ashamed of the fact that I have bipolar disorder, type one with psychotic features. I turn to my wife and I ask for help. Men must start asking for help. I use every method of proven, reputable, formidable therapies that I can find. I utilize sleep therapy. You know what I do? I turn on Pandora and the sleep channel 20 minutes before I go to bed every night so I can rest easier. 
I exercise five days a week, 23 minutes a day. Why? Because 23 minutes of exercise every day leads to 12 hours of better mood. That is a fact. What does 23 minutes of exercise every day, twice a day lead to? Mathematicians, potentially 24 hours of better mood. I educate myself about everything I can find on bipolar disorder. My favorite book, Bipolar for Dummies. <laughs> I do this and so much more, including light box therapy every morning for 45 minutes as I answer my emails. And today, I travel the globe spreading a message of hope. Why? Because we know it helps people heal. I'm making a film right now called Suicide, the Ripple Effect, a documentary that is taking me across eight countries in this globe, introducing me to people from all over the world who are fighting suicide and trying to develop methods of prevention that are successful. This film reaches out to men of all ages who are suffering quietly and we're trying to get them from the darkness to the light and let them know and understand that even if you cannot see the hope, keep moving forward because I promise you it is there. I will never die by my own hands, no matter how often I contemplate suicide. I will turn to my wife. I will turn to my father. I will turn to my friends. And I will say, I need to be in a safer place right now, or I won't be here at all. Ladies and gentlemen, there is one quote in my life that keeps me going every day moment of every day. It's from a man named Babatunde Olatunji, and it goes like this, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today, today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. So I say to each and every one in this room, let us always and forever cherish this day and every waking moment of this gifted life. Thank you. As a psychologist and mental health advocate, suicide prevention is professionally relevant. But I'm also a daughter, a sister, a partner, an aunt, a friend, and coworker to many men, and mother to three boys. So men's mental health matters to me. But this issue became incredibly personal when I lost my younger brother to suicide. Carson was a 34-year-old businessman and an entrepreneur in Denver, Colorado, father of two living with bipolar illness, fighting with it for most of his adult life until it be proved to be fatal. In the aftermath of his death, our family and friends started the Carson J. Spencer Foundation to both prevent what happened to him as well as to celebrate the life that he lived through entrepreneurship and innovation. In the interim, between then and now, I too have suffered the bone-crushing effects of depression, and I know how hard it is to ask for help. We um, first started the foundation answering this question. Well, I'm trying to understand why, what happened to Carson, and why four out of five people who die by suicide are men. Next slide. And we did this by listening. We had focus groups and surveys and in-depth interviews with men who had survived their own suicide attempts. And we asked them, how do we reach you, and what do you need? Next slide. And here's what they told us. They told us first, and these are especially what we call double jeopardy men men with a number of risk factors who are also least likely to seek help on their own. They said, you need to ease up on the mental health language on the first approach, because most of the times we're not seeing our, our despair and distress through a lens of depression or anxiety, but we see that as overwhelming life challenges and stress. So help us connect the dots to these things, um, but you need to shift your language a little bit. They also said, you can reach us by making it funny. And I thought, oh my god, suicide prevention is not hard enough. Now we've got to make it funny and make sure that we don't offend a bunch of people. And I'll share with you the results from that in just a second. They wanted stories of hope and recovery, real men with vicarious credibility that they could look to as hope, as beacons of hope for change, just like Kevin. Um, they wanted to understand that changes in sleep and energy were, could be possibly be connected to things like depression, anxiety, and trauma responses. 
And finally, they asked us to meet them where they are, not to expect them to come to mental health clinics or to mental health websites, but to create things that, that would go to where they were already being. Next slide. Um, they wanted um, reciprocity and a chance to give back and make meaning out of their struggle. Women don't necessarily have an issue reaching out for help and having that be the end of the transaction. But for men, it, it tends to be a little bit more meaningful if they can help the next guy behind them and help teach them what they have learned. And then they wanted us to help coach the men and women around them, their coworkers, their bosses, their partners, even their children, on how to have these difficult conversations and support them um, and, and, and lift them up. And then they told us, at least give us a chance to fix ourselves. It's so incredibly hard and countercultural for many of us to reach out and ask for help. Um, give us some tools where we can benchmark how depressed are we, how anxious, um, and then some things that maybe we can try at a first pass to, to address them ourselves. Next slide. So the solutions we came up were twofold. Next slide. The first being suicide prevention in the workplace. The idea was if we were reaching children and youth through schools, we would meet, reach these adult men through the workplace. So we focused on high-risk industries. And this morning, we had a briefing at Health and Human Services with a number of these representatives from fire service, law enforcement, construction, um, the transportation industry, and so on. And we did deep dives within these industries to really understand the cultural relevance, where there was strengths and opportunities, as well as where there was needs. Um, we looked at all of these risk factors. Where is there fearlessness and stoicism? Where do we have access to, to firearms or medication that could be potentially lethal in the workplace? Is there a culture of substance abuse? Is that how men are trying to cope with these difficult mental health conditions? Um, are there uh, isolation and fragmentation within the work community? And what happens when there is a humiliating event or a sense of purposelessness? Um, next slide. What we did then is we translated the US Air Force evidence-based model for comprehensive and sustained pr suicide prevention to these civilian workplaces. And the most important part was that it needed to start from the top. We needed to get leadership buy-in to really um, promote these strategies and make it a health and safety priority. Next slide. The second strategy is one um, that actually brought us here today. It's called the Man Therapy Project, and it uses humor to engage men to think about men in a proactive way. And rather than talk about it, what I'd like to do is share a video. And thank you, Ben, for hooking this up. There's a little touch and go a second ago, and he, he pulled it all together. Um, as he's pulling that together, I'd like to acknowledge the partners on the Man Therapy Did Project. Did you know that men have feelings, too? Go ahead. I'll, I'll do it in the next No, time. not just the hippies. All of us. Hello. I'm Dr. Rich Mahogany. Welcome to Man Therapy. Man Therapy is the story of a campaign that started in Colorado, but went on to spark discussion across the U.S. and around the globe. We were hired to help reduce the suicide rate for working-aged men in Colorado. First, we had to address the cause of suicide, mental health issues, anxiety, anger, depression, substance abuse. Our mission was clear, preempt suicide by helping men before they are in crisis. So we used humor. Yoga isn't just for yuppies anymore. And a manly man's approach to get men paying attention. Man Therapy is hosted by Dr. Rich Mahogany, a fictional health professional who's part doctor, part football coach, and part drinking buddy. Men have a way of doing things. A man has his way of eating, of exercising, and of straightening up. And at mantherapy.com, we set out to make the world's first comprehensive mental health website for men, where our fake doctor encourages patients to take his patented five-minute survey, the 18-point head inspection. Man Therapy takes the stigma head on, educates about mental health, provides assessments, and gives men the tools and resources to fix themselves. Before we knew it, mantherapy.com started receiving visits from around the world. We took advantage of the momentum and sent out man therapy kits to media and therapy pros. They praised our novel approach and helped us spread the word even further. Health departments from other states started inquiring about adopting the campaign. And then we got another call from Down Under. I'm Dr. Brian Ironwood. Beyond Blue, a health promotion charity, wanted to bring man therapy to the millions of Aussie men battling the same mental health stigma we see here in the U.S. And so was born Dr. Mahogany's brother from a uterus down under. 
Man Therapy has received more than 200 million impressions globally, and here in the U.S., more than 60,000 men have participated in the 18-point head inspection. You don't get this without putting in the work. Dr. Mahogany and the Man Therapy campaign have proven that when it comes to tackling the tough issue of men's mental health, using humor gets serious results. If I can get um, Jared and Joe to stand, please, while we get to the next slide. Where are you guys? All right, no, you're in the back. They're in there. Stand up, guys. These are the creative uh, team partners, Joe from Cactus Marketing and Jared Heineman from Colorado's Public Health. Um, this has just been a beautiful partnership, private, public, nonprofit partnership, and uh, it's, it's, we've been going on since 2007, and we're never going to quit. Um, next slide. Um, so what I wanted to say, um, can I also get all the guys who came out from Colorado, Seattle, Wisconsin, all the guys who presented this morning, would you please rise? <laughs> These are the men living this work every day, implementing these programs and um, really shifting culture. These are you know, not mental health professionals. These are firefighters, law enforcement, construction guys, and so forth, and it's, and it's a truly an honor to work with them. Um, the Man Therapy Project, I have just two announcements about that. Um, you'll see next week that we are, um, if you visited the site before, it's going to be a new deal next week. Um, we are repositioning um, it on a new platform of technology so that it'll be far more interactive and dynamic and personalized where guys can come back and check in on their results and get served up the things that are most relevant to their story. Um, the other thing that we did is that we have now incorporated specific tools and media assets for male veterans and military and male first responders and so that'll continue its evolve over time. I hope that you um, consider bringing us to your state, your department, whatever, and helping us distribute it. When you saw the Australia example, Australia as a country has poured millions of dollars into the Man Therapy Australia version. One in three people in Australia knows about Man Therapy. Hardly anybody knows about it here, and we developed it, so that's just not right. Um, so in closing, I want to show one, one last Man Therapy video, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to our breakout session. Picking up new hobbies such as cooking is another manly way to avoid depression and reduce stress. Today, I'm going to teach you how to make my world famous guaco mahogany. First, mash up five or six of these green things, then add hot sauce, that's lettuce stuff, these red things, salt. Some of this stuff, and limes, <laughs> and finally, bacon to taste. going so far? Well, um, I know that we had some challenges uh, with everyone getting in on time, but we are on a pretty strict live stream schedule. So because of that, we are going to have to modify the way we do our breakouts, as in we are not actually going to have breakouts. We're going to take a sort of 15 minute uh, biology break and for the speakers that we have that were going to speak during the breakout, if you could please just meet me over here in this room. Uh, we're going to talk about how we can modify the program on the back end when we're out of the live stream portion of it. So I apologize for those of you because we had some very exciting breakouts coming up. It is according to my phone 342. We will reassemble back in this room at 355. If you were a breakout speaker, please come with me to this room over on this side. Thank you all very much, and I will see you in about 15 minutes.
I hope everyone uh, enjoyed their their break. I want to make sure that everyone has a folder with our materials in it. I specifically want you to go to the bio section to make sure that you have information on all of the speakers from this morning, but especially for the esteemed group that has joined me just now. These are the breakout speakers that um, we unfortunately were not able to accommodate because we want to continue to show this program live stream so that so many others can benefit from the amazing information that we have heard. Um, again, I want to thank them for all of their preparation to be with us today. I know that we will not have an opportunity to hear from them the way that we wanted to, but I want to give them an opportunity to take a moment to just say hello to you. And for those of you who are available to stay after the close of the program, we will be upstairs in room 430. Many of the speakers that did not have an opportunity to share with you, we will be upstairs for about 30 to 45 minutes. So we encourage you, if you can, join us after the program to please stay and have conversations with these wonderful speakers. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Rick Bothwell. I am a public health advisor with the Men's Health Network, but spent 37 years with the Indian Health Service prior to that, and I also currently work, work with the Hampton University Minority Men's Health Initiative. Greetings, everyone. I'm David Grimian, Dr. David Grimian. I'm infectious disease specialist. I'm representing the Board of Directors Men's Health Network. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Doug French. I am the co-founder and programming director of the DAD 2.0 Summit. You may have seen these on the way in. We are a social media conference about how great it is to be a father. Uh, we work obviously with brands a lot to try and uh, affect change through messaging. And we, uh, for example, the Super Bowl last year I thought was terrific in terms of all the, you see lots of brands that are um, affecting a very pro-father stance. I think it does a great job for all of us in terms of shifting stereotypes and um, establishing men as uh, capable caregivers. Uh, I think I'm here because our job is to engage men and we talk uh, about all manner of things. Obviously we talk about brands and blogs, but beneath that everything you need to find your groove as a, as a writer and as a father and as a man. Uh, and we have a health panel every year. Last year was about depression, this year will be about cancer. We're very active in November, we're very active in Place 60. We have lots of partners that deal with uh, keeping uh, kids physically fit and how dads can be involved in their kids' lives. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Our fifth conference is coming up uh, in six weeks, but who's counting? Uh, I've slept about six hours in the past week. And uh, we'll be at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel here in DC. We're very happy to be here and very proud to, to have reached this milestone. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. My name is Rourke Weaver. I'm a person in long-term recovery. And from what that means to me is that I haven't had a drink or a drug uh, since April 12th of 2007. Um, I'm representing. <laughs> You can join the illustrious crowd of population, my mom, for whenever for people who clap every time I say that. Uh, I w work for an organization called Phoenix Multisport. We offer no barrier to access, free services um, to anybody who has 48 hours sober and a commitment to a sober lifestyle. We do things like rock climbing, mountaineering, skiing, snowboarding, backpacking, CrossFit, boxing, yoga, strength training. We do the gamut, and it's zero dollars. We offer uh, seven-day-a-week programming. Um, anybody who wants to come in and receive services, we can offer the continuum of care um, so that when somebody leaves formalized treatment, when that hand is taken away, there's always a hand there to help them out. Uh, that's all. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Yvette Rooks. I am a family physician. I practice in inner city Baltimore, where I am the executive vice chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine, and I run the residency training program that teaches our young family medicine doctors coming out in the world. I also have the privilege of being the head team physician at the University of Maryland at College Park, go Terps. And I do a lot of community grassroots work with mental health um, in the inner city of Baltimore. Our office is about six blocks from the notorious riots in April, but those are my patients, the patients I care the most about. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Barham. I am a, I'm a uh, international master chef, and I was formerly head of nutrition and wellness at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. 
in a test group study we started in 08 uh, of 8,000 people to uh, 20, uh, 2013 in November. We lost 380,000 pounds and we reduced pharmacological dependency by 26 percent. We made marked improvements in the areas of diabetes and heart disease. So I'm now a consultant with American Indian Nat Native American nations and I uh, advise uh, Choctaw, Chumash, Shoshone, all the tribes, major tribes in the United States to battle obesity and heart disease and obesity amongst the Indian population in the United States. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Daryl Davidson. I'm representing the City of Milwaukee Health Department in our men's health program as well as our three men's health centers which are one-stop shops for men. Health promotion, health education, health outreach is all done out of that location and it's different and unique because it is a public health nursing model. If you want to learn more, please take a look at my contact information. I also want to let you know that we have an expansive Men's Health Referral Network, which are our partner agencies which introduce men to a lot of things that they consider to be their priority areas, including jobs, housing, family service issues, fatherhood issues. We run the gamut and we try to do everything because we keep saying there's always something that they can do to improve their health. So I'm representing not only that Men's Health Referral Network, but also our Black Boys and Men's Advisory Council, which comes out of our City of Milwaukee City Hall. So if you want to learn more, please give us a call. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing? My name is Kamatni Rawlins. I'm the founder of uh, the Fit Fathers Foundation as well as the publisher of FitFathers.com. And our big fundraiser is in June, um, Fit Fathers Day. And leading up to that, we host an array of social workouts. And what we try to do is engage fathers to be more active um, uh, in the household, not only through fitness, but taking up some of the matriarchal roles of the household, you know, so fixing the kids' lunch, doing some of the shopping, and realizing that the majority um, of chronic disease prevention is focused on food and nutrition. You know, 1.6 million people die annually of the top 15 chronic diseases. So we want to make our community uh, more proactive opposed to reactive when they come down with a symptom. Um, <clears throat> so definitely check us out at uh, fitfathers.com. We have an array of content that we send out monthly um, from recipes to workouts and just social engagement. Thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Willie Isles. I'm representing the Boy Scouts of America. One question, if you've ever been a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout, raise your hand. You just validated why I'm here. It is very important that we go back and remember within those organizations, we develop young people to be physically strong. At the same time, when you look at the number of men that are involved in our program, we have 57 million living alumni. At a later time, let's talk about the big picture, offering solutions about healthy living. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Greg Pecchia, uh, here uh, through, uh, with three organizations, the Men's Health Network, uh, the American Osteopathic Association, and also my employer, Eisenhower Medical Center in uh, Rancho Mirage in the greater Palm Springs area. I'm a geriatrician, adult medicine specialist, and uh, executive uh, wellness uh, health. Essentially, uh, we've, our tagline at Eisenhower Medical Center is, the, uh, is healthcare as it should be. And I think uh, from what I'm hearing today that uh, men, uh, the, the move toward men and access toward coverage for health care also needs uh, uh, support to take that to the next step, which is health care itself. So access for care. And uh, we have a project that's been quite successful at accomplishing uh, that. And uh, I'm honored to be here today. Thank you. I'm Dave DeBroncar from Nashville, New Hampshire. In 2007, I was diagnosed as almost dead with stage four kidney cancer, median survival 24 weeks. That didn't happen. Uh, and <laughs> but it's important because the, I got a combination of the best of medicine and my primary physician recommended a good community of other patients on the internet which today my oncologist says contributed to my survival because they had all kinds of information that wasn't in the medical literature. And I didn't know it at the time, but the way I did that, 
uh, was what's now known as being an e-patient, empowered, engaged, equipped, enabled. I did not expect the establishment to do everything for me. I stepped up and did as much of the work as I was capable of. He and I, my primary physician and I, were among the co-founders of the Society for Participatory Medicine, which is completely about stepping up and doing your share of the work, and of course, physicians welcoming us in doing this. I am proud to say that I'm one of the 400 members of a, a, a movement that was created by a widow, widow of the same disease. Uh, her husband was not able to get care before the Affordable Care Act uh, and ended up dying when maybe he, he could have been saved. She is an artist with few resources but heart, soul, and spine. And she, she realized that people are walking around with medical stories but nobody can see them for the same reasons, especially with a lot of men, that we just, we'd rather not talk about it that way. She, what she will do is take your blazer and paint your story on it. <laughs> if you will wear it to events like this, because believe me, walking through an airport, it starts conversations. <laughs> but it gets me, the empowerment, is terrific. We've got to make it happen. So thank you. Uh, if you could please just give those uh, facilitators one more round of applause. Thank you. AT, you got health insurance, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Boy. Uh, no, no, I, I got it somewhere, you know? Man, stop lying. Did you ever get your ankle looked at? I mean, nah, but I think it's fine. No, oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> Bro, why don't you just get the health insurance? Cause, man, I don't know anything about it. I don't know where to get it. Oh, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Check this out. January 21st is National Youth Enrollment Day for health insurance. I'm gonna find an enrollment day event right now, and we going. Enrollment day, that ain't real. Oh, really? Well, last year there were 200 events all over the country, and this year there's probably gonna be more. What type of event we talking about? Man, everything. People do fairs, they put up information tables at college campuses, health insurance trivia night, they do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's this for again? Well, if you, health insurance. The events educate young people on health care and health insurance, and they help you get enrolled. I just got one question. What's that? You gonna carry me? <laughs> um, thank you very much. My name is Taylor Erickson. I represent a benevolent organization called Hope Worldwide. It's a faith-based nonprofit, um, specifically a youth program called the National Youth Advisory Council. We're very excited to be involved in enrollment efforts with HHS and Young Invincibles and all that. Um, it's great to make videos like this, uh, to do, be able to uh, have ways to communicate with young people in ways that young people you know, respond to. Uh, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, but uh, right now, it's my distinguished honor to present the CEO of the Marketplace, Kevin Conahan. Well, this is, a, this is a great privilege to be here, and it was interesting in uh, looking at that video there. Uh, it harkens back to my time about 10 years ago when I joined the administration uh, in Massachusetts at that time to implement health reform back in 2006. And we did all this research on how, why young males in particular uh, were such a reluctant buyer of health insurance. And, and we actually did a fair amount of quantitative research. But the basic, the basic uh, summary of it was is that they'd rather spend the premium money to buy beer than, uh, than to buy health insurance. So we had a, we had a more competitive challenge ahead of us. Well, what we ended up doing was finding out that the best way to get to young men was through their mothers. 
And so we had an annual Mother's Day campaign, which was to get insured for your mother. But it was targeted to the mothers. So what ended up happening is, if Johnny didn't buy health insurance, the mother ended up buying it for Johnny. And, sh and they tended to pick the most expensive plans because apparently nothing was too good for Johnny. But, but in any case, uh, this has been a, a very important issue, which is trying to get men engaged, not just in buying health insurance, but also in health. Uh, we know, for example, that just from basic data, that if you look at sports injuries, for example, that 93% of those injuries are, are, are male related. Uh, if you look at who makes decisions in the household around health insurance, over 80% of those decisions are typically made by the female partner or the female spouse. Um, if you look at, at the uninsured, what we have left, which is about 10.5 million, uh, over 50%, roughly 57% of them are men. So clearly, trying to get men engaged in the importance of health and the importance of, of having health insurance is a critical objective of ours. And we're making good progress. And I'd like to just to, to share a little statistics with you. Since open enrollment began for 2016, and it began on November 1st, um, we have now had over 11.3 million people that have enrolled for coverage. This is either new customers or, or, or re-enrollees. Of that 11.3, over 3 million are brand new, um, and which, is, which is good, good progress. So, we, and we're also seeing in this open enrollment period, which is our third year, as, as, as you know, that we're seeing a more engaged consumer. So for example, the call center reports that consumers are now calling uh, with better understanding of insurance terms. So two years ago, when such terms as copay, deductible, coinsurance, out-of-pocket maximum, all those kinds of things, we're very, very foreign to folks. People are calling back now with a better understanding of what those are and are a lot more savvy uh, about how to buy health insurance. We have about 24 days left of open enrollment this year. Open enrollment ends January 31st. That's the, that's the last day for coverage in, in 2016, outside of special circumstances. And what I would just ask of you is to just strongly do what you can within your communities and organizations to please Help, help us communicate the importance of this open enrollment period for people. Over 83% of people that enroll qualify for tax subsidies, which means they get subsidized uh, insurance. And the subsidy is powerful. The average premium nationally uh, after the subsidy is about $137 a month. And seven out of 10 people can find coverage for less than $75 a month after the, the, the tax credits. So, so these are very, very powerful. We've also introduced new support tools to help people find doctors in their network that are very, very important to them. They simply just need to record those specialists or primary, primary care docs. And the system will automatically tell people within their zip code what health plans include those doctors. The same thing is true for maintenance medication, and the same thing is true for understanding out-of-pocket cost maximums. We have, we have an estimator now that people can use to show not just the premium cost, but also the coinsurance and the deductible and, and a total cost. So what we're clearly trying to do is to build on this momentum. The, the best thing that we can do, in our view, uh, to maintain a competitive free market marketplace, which is what this is. This is insurance companies, the you know, brand name insurance companies, duking it out in, into the, the, those state marketplaces, trying to get people's business. The best way we can maintain that viability and stability is through enrollment. Our enrollment, quite frankly, is going better than we expected. We're delighted with it. We got 24 more days to go, and, uh, and we're pushing hard to make sure that we, get, we reach as many people as possible. So while this is a conference on men's health, and clearly men's health is, is, a, is a key, important uh, element, we're really trying to make sure that everybody, as much as possible, can get health insurance because data shows that people that are insured actually get better quality of care than people that are uninsured, even for the same types of procedures. We also know, too, that even though the law is only two years old, that it's making a difference. Cervicular cancer rates, for example, are down 10 percent since the law was enacted. And the number of insured people has increased by 17.6 million, and the uninsured rate has dropped to 9 percent, which is the lowest rate in history. So are we running any victory laps? No. Do we have a long way to go? You bet. But we're chipping away, we're making progress, and we appreciate all the help that you can provide. Thanks. And now I'd like to invite 
our next panel on men's health and sports and partnerships for men's health awareness. And I'm going to need one more chair. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dennis Moore. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for the Denver Broncos. All right. <laughs> uh, and uh, with, with that, uh, ho hopefully this is a little more lighthearted and fun than some of the others. So uh, w w welcome to the uh, NFL playoffs and, uh, and wild card on behalf of uh, everybody associated with the NFL. So. Uh, I, first, it's what an honor and a privilege when you get uh, when you're a sports marketer and, and uh, you decide as an organization you can make a positive impact in your community and in, in health and wellness uh, to get an email from the White House uh, that somebody at the White House was impacted by some of your programs. What a really cool honor and a great testament to some of the cool things we're doing in Denver uh, and in Colorado. So really appreciative of the opportunity to be here. Uh, in conjunction uh, with welcoming two new healthcare partners to the Denver Broncos in the last year, University of Colorado Health Systems, uh, as well as a pediatric partner, uh, Children's Hospital Colorado, uh, we jumped full, full steam into a, a health and wellness initiative. Uh, and really our, our three primary objectives uh, are on the slide there. Uh, we feel that uh, not only is the Denver Broncos, but if you step back even from our brand, which we live uh, every day, we feel that a sports team in general, whether it's, it's the National Football League, uh, MLB, NHL, you name it, we feel that we, we can embody what health and wellness ought to be about, right? We, we are an embodiment uh, of some of the most fit people. We are in the embodiment of nutrition, hopefully, right, in an ideal scenario. So we really went uh, full steam with how can our organization make a positive impact and the health and wellness of our fans. We hope through those three objectives, we want to ultimately one day be able to say, the Denver Broncos have the healthiest fan base in the National Football League. We think that embodies what that our brand is all about. We think that means great things for our fans. We think that means great things for Denver. We think that means great things for Colorado. And ultimately, our fans are all over the country, so that does not have boundaries. That does not have capacity. And hopefully we're starting to take the steps to create programs uh, that are going to allow us to one day be able to own that moniker. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Before we get to a very short video, uh, we, we uh, a 90 second video, uh, this past November we partnered with the University of Colorado Health. Uh, and this is very much in the marketing PR component, but we, the entire month, uh, we we uh, uh, partnered to bring awareness to men's health issues. Our primary call to action was very simple. If you're a man, contact your primary care physician and go get checked. It was a pretty simple call to action. We also knew we had a pretty big platform. We played on Sunday night football, November 29th. At the time, we played the undefeated New England Patriots at home. We gave away 80,000 free orange mustaches to everybody in attendance. With the, with the single goal of raising awareness and setting a Guinness World Records for the most number of people wearing false mustaches in one setting. <laughs> this video speaks to that.
responsibility here today is to declare an attempt at the most people wearing false moustaches simultaneously. It's uh, my pleasure to present a brand new Guinness World Record certificate, which means you are officially amazing. All right. That's good. Awesome. Good. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You notice at the end that was my uh, really tough attempt at a handlebar mustache. I went with the real thing. Uh, but we are, in fact, now obviously a Guinness uh, World Record holders. In addition to the 80,000 people that were in attendance, uh, from what we've been able to measure, it was roughly 85 million uh, earned media impressions around that cause. And so it, it was a huge home run in terms of drawing awareness to the cause. Uh, lastly, just to highlight uh, one other specific activation that we embarked upon. Uh, from October 12th uh, through the Monday leading into Thanksgiving, uh, we uh, did a 45-day health and fitness challenge. Our primary objective here uh, was uh, really twofold. One is we needed to get beyond the physical space of hosting an event or doing something at the stadium, move more in a digital sphere so that we could touch our fans, whether you lived in Washington, D.C., or whether you lived in Denver, Colorado. We needed something without boundaries. Second, really, this eliminated any capacity issues. For the first time uh, we, we embarked upon this, we had uh, just under 11,000 people that participated uh, in this daily challenge for 45 days. It was very simple, started, we put an email out to every single participant at 5 a.m. every day. Here is what your goal for the day is. Every day had four objectives, whether it was drink eight glasses of water today, do 20 push-ups, very simple, low barrier. We wanted people to feel success. Uh, participants participate, 65% of our participants participated every single day of that challenge. We were blown away. I put a few of the, uh, uh, testimonies that we got from people who participated in this program. It was significant. We got hundreds of people who were emailing us saying, this made a positive difference. I lost 10 pounds. My diabetes is under control. It was something very significant. So I le those are just two very small examples of at the Broncos, how we feel a sports team can play a very significant role. Um, it is all about partnerships for us. We need to partner with organizations that lead credibility to what we're doing and expertise. We are a football team at the end of the day. We are a sports team. We need partnerships. So in the spirit of what's next for us, uh, what I dream of next is the ability to be a source of wearable technology for our fans, for people who can't ordinarily afford those. Uh, we are looking, we're speaking with several health foundations in the state of Colorado. How can we fund the ability to provide wearables and actually track uh, metrics on people's health. Uh, we think that's a significant next steps for us at the Denver Broncos. It would be incredibly innovative how we communicate. Um, and as I like to say, it's bringing the sizzle of, um, you know, hey, it's one thing if, if a doc is telling you to be healthy. It's another thing if Peyton Manning is, is saying those words and our fans have a way of paying attention to that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Michael Lutz, and I'm a physician and partner at the Michigan Institute of Urology. Well, back in 2008, when President Barack Obama was actually elected into office, it was that fall, was the beginning of our foundation. So here we are today at the White House, kind of symbolism. It's very interesting to know that our foundation has long roots, and strong roots, mainly because of our foundation board members, who are committed members from the community and are really committed volunteer advisory committee. But then again, it's partnerships. And if we go on to the next slide, you can't have successful events without having good partners. And so we are really lucky to have Ford Motor Company to be our home. And so we have the Ford family, the, the Henry Ford, the Detroit Lions, and Ford Field as successful partners for our event called the men's health event. And our men's health event was actually implemented and created going back in 2011 and is held annually to help our underserved population. We have 68% of the attendees are men of African descent. 50% of them have financial uh, incomes of under $35,000 a year. 30% are unemployed and sadly, 30% are also uninsured. These people need our help. They need our help more than just one day a year but it has to start somewhere. And this is an event that we use to engage and educate and screen men 
from all walks of life who come to Ford Field to learn about kicking field goals with Eddie Murray, to have a chance to go onto the field to kick field goals, but also get screened, get educated, and will even openly stand in line for HIV screening with on-the-spot results and with immediate counseling available. That's what makes this event unique. And on top of that, every individual who attends that event is a source of data. And what I mean is, is we capture their data so that we can better understand the health and welfare of our men in our community because I'm certain that it's similar to other communities around the United States. And we look forward to sharing this data and hoping that other cities around the United States will copy and even improve on this model so that going forward, we can all be part of a successful men's health event. We do other things, such as our prostate cancer survivorship series and our Run for the Ribbon, which now is one of the largest prostate cancer runs in the nation, held on Father's Day, how symbolic. And also it's held at the Detroit Zoo, which is a great venue. But the last event that I want to talk about briefly is Blue Monday. Men's Health Network put on the map Men's Health Week through an act of our bipartisan vote through the Senate in 1994. We want to add another layer on top of it. Blue Monday being June 13th this year in 2016 is the first day of Men's Health Week. And it's a day that everyone here can take ownership of and make it yours. Make it what it means to you. Make it what it means to you, your business, your charity, your function. It's the message that you want to share. It's your call to action. You can own it. You can share it and be a part of Blue Monday. Next slide. So, awareness of men's health. We all talk about awareness, but better than that, it needs to be a call to action because you just can't say, I'm all about men's health. It doesn't have any impact. You have to have that call to action. It has to be about the story and the storyteller. And we're lucky in Detroit. We have a former football quarterback in the Detroit Lions named Eric Hippel, whose story is that his son committed suicide and depression runs in their family. And he tells that story. He is the storyteller. And that's the impact. It's got to be inclusivity. It's got to be partnerships. And if you're going to be a partner and do something like this and be part of a men's health event, whether you're a mental screening organization or an oral cancer screening community, you have to take ownership and take ownership with the people that supply it. So the other thing is redefining the yes. You have to redefine what your yes is and what your why is. You have to know why you do what you do, and people have to believe what you believe. The next slide. And so really, in the end, it's all about making people believe what you believe and taking share in what you share. It's all about having partnership. We're lucky having the Detroit Lions. Last slide. Got it. Making Rory healthy, that's really important. And it's also about saving one life at a time. And you know, it's actually written in the Jewish liturgy, in the Talmud, and it says one thing, is to save one life is as if you've saved the world. So this is our moment to save a life and save the world. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Christian Matthews, Vice President of Strategy and Sponsorship for the hometown Washington Redskins. My colleagues from the <laughs> Green Bay Packers are here, so we're having a little bit of back and forth. Um, I echo, frankly, uh, what uh, Michael and Dennis have said. Uh, we, we at the Redskins feel that w everything that we do, we think through the lens, we want to make our, our fans the healthiest fans in the National Football League. So we're very cognizant of the efforts that, that, that we do, um, and partnership, to Michael's point, is a very vital piece of that, because we can't do it on our own. And it's the type of thing we've t heard a lot about, uh, you know, raising tide raises all boats. That's how we, how we view it. So when we partner with a company like Men's Health Network or Bon Secours Health System, we're in this together to create something from the ground up, something tangible that our fans are highly interested in. And I wanted to highlight a couple of things that, that we've done over the years uh, and, and things that we're continuing to do. We, we've been working with Men's Health Network uh, for the past couple of years doing men's health screenings. And I think the big takeaway here was the fact that we've been able to, uh, to, to Dennis's point, bring the sizzle. And by, by saying that, what I mean is 
we're taking advantage of, of days that we can provide uh, resources such as FedEx Field or Redskins Park where our fans get to look behind uh, you know, a peek behind the curtain have a uh, men's health screening in the locker room get a tour of the facility this gets men off the couch out of their homes into the facility to get the screenings that they otherwise are you know not being proactive about and that's what we're, we're really proud about we're really proud that uh, these are free events that some of our uh, current and former star athletes stop by, again, adding that sizzle. And we've had success with them. Next slide. Another thing that we've done is uh, our training camp, we moved to Richmond a number of seasons ago. And the title uh, partner sponsor in that is Bon Secours Health System, which is a uh, you know, hospital system that has a major footprint in Richmond. We built our training facility and we, t we take it over in uh, July and August for training camp. The other 10 months of the year, they're using that as a health services facility. They're, they're uh, reaching out to their patients saying, you, you know, wh why don't you come have a f physical you know, where the Redskins are training, where, where you're never going to get in in you know, August 1st when they're, while they're practicing. Come, come April 1st, we, we can, we can uh, facilitate that. And we've had a couple of events there to help drive that home. Um, including this uh, it was a um, uh, men's health uh, it was a men's health screening again bringing the sizzle bringing guys uh, former athletes like Ken Harvey to it again to a, to an area that normally wouldn't get that type of exposure uh, one of the things that we've done with Bon Secours is another thing that I've not highlighted on the slide here. We, they, a current uh, player of ours um, having a fantastic season is, is Ryan Kerrigan, and he's their spokesperson. And one of the campaigns that we've done in tangent with them, I'm not sure if anybody's seen it, is Real Men See the Doctor. And this is a, a, an area that we've been pushing all season long, and it has resonated uh, to great success. And it's, a lot of these type of things are overlapping, but the, at the end of the day, it's about Again, using our star power, using our uh, power of our brand, our, our passionate fan base in a contextual manner for our, uh, you know, to raise men's health. In addition, not just men's health, we're doing things uh, across the board in health and wellness. So we have, uh, you know, we do a lot with Play 60. We do a lot, uh, we have a kids combine. Everybody has the option, uh, if you don't, you can see me, we, we produce a, men, uh, a yearly health and wellness magazine uh, that actually was just published yesterday. So this is hot off the press, but there's interviews with athletes, there's, there's kids activity, there's uh, uh, many things like that that kind of, again, bring what we're all about at the Redskins. We have a dedicated website, uh, redskinshealthandwellness.com, and multiple different uh, you know, opportunities, social media, where we've been pushing things called wellness, posts around wellness Wednesdays, uh, uh, a smoothie, Sh um, recipe from our nutritionist or a healthy meal from our executive team chef, things like that, that our fans, again, get that peek behind the curtain. And I think uh, I can, you know, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but we're hoping for a big victory on Sunday. And to that end, I'm going to turn it over to our friends from Wisconsin. <laughs> I brought my good luck charms. I have the Super Bowl rings. <laughs> <laughs> and not because I was a player, but because I'm on the Packer Board of Directors. <laughs> and I'm also the Chief Marketing Officer for Bell & Health, which is the official healthcare partner of the Green Bay Packers. And our, we have a 10-year uh, strategic partnership and relationship with the Packers that I'm sure uh, will, will, will be You'll hear a lot of things that, that we've done that are very similar to, to our, 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 my other colleagues here. One thing that it strikes me, though, is that after the Super Bowl is over, I think there are three or four of us that need to go to New York and meet with Commissioner Goodell and help him, have him help us decide who is going to really have the healthiest fans in the <laughs> NFL. I think, that is a, I think that's a, a, a fascinating idea. Uh, that it's, it's born as a result of, of today's meeting, and I think the commissioner would be very, very interested in, in, in doing something like that. Uh, last year, we started a campaign that sounds very much like what Christian said. Our, our tagline was, real men don't wait. 
And it was designed to try to get men to make a, make a commitment to see their, their, their primary care physician, try to get connected. And the bulk of that campaign was really uh, a one-way uh, approach, and it did, not have, it did not have the call to action that we, that we needed. We weren't exactly sure which the, what call to action we, we would, would resonate with, 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 our, with our people, our, our, our patients. Until one day, a woman called and she said, we used Jordy Nelson, by the way, as our spokesperson. She said, I want one of those Jordy Nelson physicals for my husband. But we didn't have a Jordy Nelson physical at that time. But this year we did. And David Sankamy, uh, my colleague, uh, is director of marketing at Bell, is going to tell you a little bit about the uh, Jordy Nelson challenge. David? Hello, everyone. So as Tom mentioned, our, the, the work that we've done in the men's health uh, space in partnership with the Green Bay Packers has been a uh, a two-year commitment. Last year was about education and awareness, and it was anchored in a microsite that had content related to key men's health issues. And one of the things that we came together to talk about was having a metric to measure kind of the impact that we were making in the marketplace. And while we were looking at the growth in the number of uh, male patients in our panel, we also wanted to get people through the door and eliminate the access barrier. So one of the things that we <coughs> rolled out this year was the Jordy Nelson Health Assessment. It's a free assessment available to men who haven't been to the doctor in three years. And again, everything is anchored in getting people back to, to the website to learn more about you know, the key issues affecting men, but ultimately getting in to see a primary care doc. And uh, I'm gonna invite Dr. Gast, who is one of our physicians who has performed uh, many of the Jordy Nelson health assessments, and then we're going to show you some of the creative that's been uh, part of the campaign this year. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Gass, one of the family doctors. My role in the Jordy Nelson campaign is straightforward. As, as David said, I am one of the primary care docs that we're trying to get these gentlemen into. The program that we've been following that's been working fairly well is a day prior or even hours prior to their appointment, we have them come in for fasting labs, your basic labs that you would do for disease screening, blood glucose, kidney function, liver function, cholesterol. They come in for their appointment and they have routine vital signs done. My role then is to come in and interpret. Interpret in as much a hands-off non-invasive, non-intimidating, non-anxiety provoking fashion as possible. The men that I've been seeing range anywhere from mid-20s to mid-50s. As we heard earlier today, that's a population, especially in the 20s and 30s, that has really been kind of scared to come in. So we tried to maintain this hands-off approach. We didn't want to scare them away once they're in the door. Um, Truthfully, in this population, I have not seen a tremendous amount of urgent things that needed to be taken care of right now. There's been a couple. But the biggest benefit that I have seen from this is that the majority of these men, if not all, have made a follow-up appointment. We broke down the barriers, we got them in the door, and didn't scare them away. Hopefully, this program is in its infancy. It hasn't been around that long. But hopefully, as it continues, gains momentum, that pattern of rescheduling appointments will continue as well. So <clears throat> we wanted to share some of the uh, kind of the tactics that were part of this this campaign. Again, the, the Packers Partnership creates is a tremendous platform for us to to get to where men are, right? Because on any given Sunday, any given Packer Sunday, 84% of our Green Bay marketplace is either at the game, watching, or listening to the game online. So we used a, a multi-channel approach to, uh, to reach men because, as we know, men sometimes need reminding. So uh, on the screen here, uh, on, on the top is uh, some transit wraps that uh, we had developed as part of the campaign on Packer Sundays, 
uh, as in many NFL markets, you know, the, the Green Bay Metro system uh, provides free rides to fans going to the, to the games. Uh, beneath that are, are some banner ads, but um, again, more, a lot, lot of the, uh, the banners are, are, <coughs> are pushing folks directly to making an appointment for the Jordan Health, Jordy Health Assessment and also just on uh, general information about men's health. And then finally, I wanted to show uh, a couple of TV spots, one from last season's campaign and then one uh, presenting the Jordy Nelson Health Assessment. You're a man, assessment. and you're strong. Not just strong, Jordy Nelson strong. Not just Jordy Nelson strong. Jordy Nelson, if Jordy Nelson was a superhero strong. But if you want to be a hero to your family, you've got to be Jordy Nelson smart, which means you have to start protecting yourself now so that you can be around to protect them. Otherwise, you can't be Jordy Nelson. Welcome to Bell and Hood. <laughs> and this, okay. I guess we, I, I don't, the, the other spot. We can the other one. Okay, all right. Thank you, the other spot. <laughs> You're a man, and you're strong. Not just strong, Jordy Nelson strong. Not just Jordy Nelson strong. Jordy Nelson, if Jordy Nelson was a superhero strong. But if you want to be a hero to your family, you've got to be Jordy Nelson smart, which means you have to start protecting yourself now so that you can be around to protect them. Otherwise, you can't be Jordy Nelson. Welcome to Bell and Health. Wow, thank you all for an amazing day. Uh, someone said that at the top of the day, I failed to introduce myself. So before you leave, <laughs> why don't I just tell you who I am? My name is Stephanie Owens, and I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So I want to thank you all for joining us. We are going to have one final speaker to provide closing remarks. And then before we end for the day, I actually need to see all of the speakers just for a moment. So if you'll give us just a moment, we will move to our close. Did everyone enjoy themselves? Yeah. Yeah. There are uh, plenty of other ways that you could have spent your Friday afternoon, so I appreciate you spending it here with us. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And now I'd like to introduce for our closing remarks, I'd like to bring up our Cabinet Secretary, Broderick Johnson, again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So anybody who uh, knows me knows I have to always say something about the Michigan Wolverines. Are there any uh, Wolverines in this room? There we go. Go blue. All right. Uh, Jim Harbaugh is going to be at the State of the Union next week, by the way, which is rather historic. He's been invited by two members of Congress, a Democrat and a Republican, so he's doing his bipartisan thing right. but. Um, but uh, we're, we're really proud of him, aren't we? Aren't we? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, look, I just came 
to conclude by saying a couple things. Thank all of you again for uh, being here today and making this dialogue a tremendous success. I know there have been a lot of very stimulating discussions today. It's so important that we take what we've done here today and build momentum around the simple and important steps that we can take to elevate these issues. Uh, as I was coming over here, I reflected on the fact that, um, that I get to work for a president, and we, this country is led by a president who is personally very committed, again, to his own personal health, but is also very concerned, of course, about the health of people across this country, especially men, and he says that all the time. So before we send you all back into the world and to your communities, I have a few requests to make on behalf of President Obama. First, each of you commit yourself to action during the Men's Week of Action, which is the week of January 18th. Um, you each have a commitment card there with you. Please take a moment before you leave. In fact, you cannot leave this room or the White House facility today until you fill out that commitment card. There are Secret Service officers outside to make sure you hand those cards. Uh, help raise awareness about healthcare.gov and coverage options so that men in our communities have access to the preventative services that will keep them healthy and have the assurance of coverage should an emergency arise. So first, commitment. Second, continue to engage with men each month beginning now through June, which by the way is Men's Health Month. Connect the dots between existing health days and weeks of action and think of creative ways to engage men during those times. For example, February, which is uh, Heart Health Month, uh, and we all know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for men. So think of Valentine's Day and making a, a healthy heart your Valentine's gift to your spouse or partner. I'm sure my wife will be excited when I say, I didn't get you a gift this year, but the gift is my heart is so healthy. <laughs> She'll, she'll be very, actually, she will be very glad because I've run out of things to give her, actually. No, 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 there's always more jewelry. Um, and look, and third, but uh, not least and not last, talk to your male friends and family about the health choices you're making yourself. Set an example and continue the dialogue. Uh, earlier this afternoon, I had uh, the pleasure of participating in a Twitter chat with the Surgeon General and with uh, Michael Botticelli. At the end of that Twitter chat, we each talked about why men's health is important to all of us and tagged five men in our networks and asked them to do the same to keep the conversation going. So now I'm asking each of you to join that conversation. Take a few minutes to go on Twitter or Facebook using the hashtag bro to bro health state why men's health matters to you and tag five men you know to do the same. Together we can begin a movement of men talking to each other about why their health matters and for taking action. We've made a lot of progress in this country throughout the first seven years of this administration and we will continue for the rest of the time that we're here. Um, today we announced, for example, that the economy added 292,000 new jobs in December. And I'm truly proud, that's right, 292,000 more jobs. Yes, that deserves applause because we know what that means to individuals and families. And so we're just uh, continue to be so proud of uh, the steps taken and progress made on so many fronts. But as I said earlier, and I'll repeat again, this isn't a, just about policy or government or just about doctors and patients. This is about using every play in the playbook to improve the lives of people across this country, again, especially the health of men. So thanks to all of you and to the staff here at the White House and at HHS who helped organize all of this. Thank you all very much for what you did today. A remarkable day. I look forward to our continuing partnership going forward. Thank all of you. Have a great weekend and a fabulous 2016. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I have a five o'clock meeting I have to get to. For those of you that are going to stay and go to the workshops, please see Ben in this corner and he will take you upstairs to 430 for those of you who are staying.